Hi class, welcome to module 12, plant disease, viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Oh my, okay. Now, you guys may remember the plant disease triangle that we just went over in module 11. Remember we have the susceptible host, uh, conducive environment, and then we have a virulent pathogen. And where those all three are around is when you'll get disease. So in today's class, we're going to talk about some of those um, virulent pathogens and some examples. Now, you remember uh, virulent pathogen, that includes fungi, fungal-like organisms, bacteria, phytoplasms, phytoplasm, viruses, viroids, nematodes, and parasitic higher plants. These are all plant pathogens. Now, we're not going to hit all of these today. We already talked about nematodes. Uh, parasitic higher plants, um, that's one that, there's only a couple of those. We're not going to really hit on those. So we're going to concentrate mainly up here. So let's move on then and take a look at some of these. Viruses. Now, what is a virus? Well, a virus is essentially a nucleic acid core surrounded by a protein uh, outer layer ca called the capsid often. And um, this outer sheath of coat protein protects the nucleic acid. The nucleic acid can be either RNA or DNA. And the very first virus that was ever described was the tobacco mosaic virus, described in 1898. And that was the first virus of any kind ever described. So plant viruses were the first ones that were looked at, uh, examined, and described. And after that, then all uh, the other viruses followed. Uh, viruses are only visible with an electron microscope. You can't see them with your naked eye. You can't even see them with a regular light microscope. You have to have an electron microscope. And plant viruses are obligate parasites. Now remember earlier when we were talking about insects, we were talking about the difference between parasites and parasitoids. Parasitoids being that they require a living host, but they kill their host. Parasites, on the other hand, require a living host. However, they don't kill their host. They just take it and use its mechanisms, its biochemistry to do their work for them. Uh, provide their food for them, everything they need, but they don't kill their host. They keep it alive. Viruses are obligate parasites. Obligate being that they are absolutely require a host to exist. Without it, they do not exist. And viruses can't self-infect. They require a wound to enter the plant. And some may be pollen transmitted, some may be seed transmitted, so they can't actually live in the pollen and the seeds of some plants. That's a little bit unusual, but it does occur. And most viruses in the field are transmitted by vectors. And a vector being simply, uh, in this case, most often it's an insect, uh, though mites, beetles, and grass, and nematodes can also vector viruses. Uh, viruses can be transmitted by grafting, but in the field, most of the infections come from vector insect vectors. And most of these vectors are insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts. Remember those, uh, the hemiptera? And here are some examples of those. Here we have a plant hopper. Here we have a leaf hopper, and you see there is a difference between the two. Aphids, definitely piercing, sucking mouth parts. Mealybugs, white fly, and thrips. Now remember all these from our study on entomology, and they have piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they are often vectors of plant viruses. And the virus is taken up into the insect when the insect is feeding on the plant, and then when it goes and feeds on another plant, it injects that into the plant that it feeds on. Now, viruses, along with their vector and their host, often have a very, very specific relationship in that many of the plant viruses only infect certain plants or certain families of plants, and they can only be vectored by certain insects. So not just any insect can transmit any virus. So 
they usually have a very specific relationship that goes on. So it's, it's quite intricate, quite detailed. And once the virus gets inside the plant, it essentially takes over the biochemical processes of the plant, and the plant then makes all the things that the virus needs, which is essentially just replication. That's all it really needs. It needs uh, more nucleic acid made, more protein made, and then the virus is happy. Now the typical leaf symptoms of viruses, we're going to go through some of these, and what you're going to see amongst uh, many of these diseases is that a lot of the symptoms are going to be very similar with viruses, sometimes with bacteria and fungi, that the, the symptoms are very, very similar. So that's why we emphasize that it's very important whenever you're dealing with any of these diseases on your plants that you identify what the disease is and what the organism is that's causing it. Now, here we have um, some of the leaf symptoms. Some of those are mosaic, and mosaic is something like this where you see uh, with tobacco mosaic virus, you see there's green and chlorotic tissue mixed together. Now this is showing the, the mosaic pattern as well, but also this leaf is showing the blistering pattern. Um, by blistering it means you see these raised bumps on the leaf. You could also call it as crinkly. Uh, that is a common symptom of virus on leaves. You also have uh, yellowing, as in this, yellow streaking on this corn plant. And the long streaks of chlorotic tissue is symptomatic of virus infection. And then there's vein clearing and vein banding. Uh, the difference between the two is this is vein clearing and this is vein banding. Vein clearing, the veins actually become translucent, almost clear. That's vein clearing. Vein banding is when the veins have dark tissue that follows along the vein. So the veins themselves are banded by darker tissue, which develops. Now the normal color of the leaf is this color green, but along the veins, the tissue gets much darker green. This is vein banding, and that is another symptom of virus infection. You can also have necrotic lesions. And these lesions would be very similar to necrotic lesions caused by bacteria and by fungi. So once again, it's important to know what is causing the disease. And often the necrotic lesions will be um, encircled by a yellow halo. Another symptom is leaf rolling or leaf curling. Uh, this is tomato leaf curl virus. And you can see on this, the leaves are cupping up. The edges are rolling up and curling. That would be leaf curling symptoms of a virus. And you'll notice that a lot of the viruses and even fungi and bacterial, the disease name includes the symptom in the name. So with this one, this is maize yellow streak virus. This is tobacco mosaic virus. This is tomato leaf curl virus. So you can see uh, that a lot of times it's the virus symptom that gives the virus its name. So there's um, no true uh, nomenclature with the genus and species when it comes to viruses. Symptoms on the flowers would be deformation of the flowers. They'd be gnarled. Uh, sometimes they'll actually produce extra petals. Sometimes the petals will turn into uh, green sepals. So it changes the whole form and structure of the, of the flower. And you can also have some dramatic changes in flowers. This is an orchid, and you can see the discoloration on the petals of the orchid. This is caused by a virus. And color breaking. Now this is a tulip, and Years and years ago, before they knew what was causing this, these tulips with the color streaks going through their petals were very valuable. And these were some of the highest cost tulips on the market. And it wasn't until much later, after they started studying viruses and looking more into detail, that the 
symptoms that viruses cause that they found out that this streaking on tulips was actually a viral infection. And its main symptom was this uh, color pattern on the tulips. So even though it could be considered a disease, it actually made these tulips more valuable. Uh, on fruits and, and the vegetables, when they are virus infected, you'll get all kinds of symptoms on the fruits themselves. This is healthy zucchini. This is zucchini that's been infected with zucchini yellow mosaic virus. And you can see it's distorted, it's wrinkly, it's got bumps on it. Same thing over here with cucumbers, infected with cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, the fruit is very misshapen. Uh, you can see this mosaic pattern on the outside of the cucumber where you have light green, dark green, light green, dark green. This is also a symptom of uh, viruses on the fruits. Uh, the fruits can be stunted. Uh, you can get discoloration, uh, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, they can be malformed or distorted, which you're seeing here. You can also get uh, modeling or spots on the fruits. This is uh, ripening tomato fruits infected with tomato spotted wilt virus. And you see these lighter chlorotic circles and regions on the ripening fruit. Essentially what this does this fruit is totally unmarketable now uh, simply because of the virus infection and what it does to the fruit. And in extreme cases, you can get huge spots of necrosis. This is a tomato fruit, also infected with tomato spotted wilt virus. And you see huge uh, necrotic spots. And you can get funky patterns. This is watermelon mosaic virus. And you can see the fruit itself has that mosaic pattern on it. It looks kind of psychedelic. And then this is papaya ring spot virus, and it causes these spots. You can see why they call it a ring spot, because you have a circle of necrotic tissue with a center that is still light colored, the same color as the fruit. Once again, you can see symptom gives the virus its name, papaya ring spot virus. Uh, watermelon mosaic virus. And if you see the leaves and such on the zucchini yellow mosaic virus, it changes the, the, the leaves to very chlorotic leaves. Some stem symptoms would be uh, pitting, grooving, you can even get tumors, uh, growth proliferation such as the witch's broom. This is a witch's broom on uh, an ornamental that is caused by a virus. Uh, Exocortis virus which infects citrus. Uh, it's got these pits on the inner side just below the bark on the trunk. That's caused by Exocortis virus. And then tomato spotted wilt virus. We've seen what it's done to the fruit. We've seen what it's done to the leaves. This is what it can do to the stems. You see these cankers formed on the stem of the tomato infected with tomato spotted wilt virus. And we looked at tomato leaf curl virus earlier, and you saw how it was causing the leaves to cup up and curl. Well, it can also cause these gall formations on the stems of the tomato. These are little tiny bumps, warts like on the stem of the tomato. And that is a result of an infection with tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Now, how do you control viruses on your plants? Well, as always, the first thing you need to do is to identify that it is a virus causing the symptoms. And then there are several methods you can use to control it. With almost all plant diseases, whenever you start a garden, what you want to do is make sure you get certified seed. In this case, it would be certified virus-free seeds and plants because some viruses are transmitted in the seed and you may want to make sure you get healthy plants to start with. If you have certified, that means they've been tested by the USDA and other agencies for known viruses that occur in those particular plants. And these have been certified to be disease free. So that's one really good way. Start clean and you're off to the right start. So start clean, stay clean. That's the best approach to controlling diseases. 
Also, remember how viruses are primarily vectored in the field uh, by insects. Well, if you control the vectors, then you're going to reduce the incidence of the viruses. So one way of helping to eliminate viruses from your plants is to control the insects that transmit them. Another is weed control. Now we're going to be talking about weeds and weed control later on in the course, uh, but remember that, that the weeds growing in your garden can be reservoirs for viruses and for the insects that vector the viruses. So by keeping your garden clean of weeds, you're going to be eliminating this source of infectious viruses or insects. So that's another good way to help to prevent viruses. Sanitation, get rid of the weeds. And a really good way is also genetic resistance. Look for varieties that have been bred with resistance to certain known viruses. And as we told you before, looking in your seed catalog or reading about certain varieties of vegetables online or in the seed catalogs, they will tell you what diseases they're resistant to. And if there are viruses, they will tell you they're resistant to the viruses. So genetic resistance, a really good way to eliminate viruses from your garden. So now, what about bacteria? We're moving on from viruses. Things are getting a little bigger as we go. Bacteria, they are microscopic single cell organisms that you can actually see with a light microscope. Still can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see them with a the light microscope. Uh, this is a simple diagram of what a typical bacterium would look like. You have a cell wall. Uh, you have the nucleic acid, the bacterial DNA. It's always circular. Uh, sometimes you'll have extra cellular DNA, in this case it's plasmid DNA, and the cytoplasm, of course, inside. So this is just a simplified drawing of what a bacterium looks like. This is a, this actually is an electron micrograph of bacteria. And plant pathogenic bacteria, there's only several hundred species of bacteria that cause disease as compared to several thousand species of fungi that cause plant diseases. Uh, but they do cause disease, and with bacteria, the only way that they actually can identify the bacterium itself to genus and species is by the colony characteristics whenever they're growing on artificial media, uh, by the biochemical properties of the bacterium, and by DNA analysis. So just looking at pictures of bacteria, they often look very, very, very much alike, and it's hard to tell one from the other. And so you have to resort to different means to identify those different bacteria. Uh, infections from bacteria, they have to occur through openings in the plant. The bacterium can't make its own opening. Uh, it can go through natural openings, such as lenticels. Uh, often you'll see spots like this on the stems of plants. Uh, this is a a tree with uh, lenticels on it. And the lenticels are just openings for air exchange that develop on plants. And this is a natural opening. It's going through the cuticle of the plant, and so bacterium can get washed into that opening uh, from rain or splatter or different things like that, and that's how bacteria can enter a lenticel. Uh, there's a hydathodes. I'm sure a lot of us have seen our leaf, the leaves on our plants looking like this with little droplets of water coming out on the edges of the plant, especially early morning after a rain or something like that, and you'll see these droplets forming. Well, those are coming out of the hydathodes, and hydathodes are always at the, the leaf margins, and it's an opening. There's a guard cell here which opens and closes, but it's one way for the plant to get rid of excess water. It's through the hydathodes. Well, that's a natural plant opening, and it's where bacteria can go in. Uh, bacteria could land into this water droplet and just go right down and into the plant through the hydathode. And the third natural opening that we're going to talk about are uh, stomata, the stomata. The stoma here, this is the stoma, this is one closed, this is one opening, and it's the stoma that regulates the amount of air exchange, gas exchange in the leaves of plants, and some, does some with the uh, moisture as well, 
but this is the, these are all over the surface of plant leaves. And when they're open like this, uh, it goes right into the interior of the leaf, and this is another way that bacteria can enter through the natural openings, the lenticels, the hydathodes, and the stomata. They can also enter through wounds created by insects feeding, and wounds that we make on the plant. If the plant gets wounded in any way, it's an opening where the defense has been broken down and bacteria can enter. And bacteria spread from plant to plant uh, from soil transfer, from insects carrying them. Uh, one of the biggies that bacteria spread uh, from soil to plants and from plant to plant is from water splashing. So uh, rainy days or overhead irrigation, you can be spreading bacteria amongst your plants. And uh, infected seeds, there are some um, diseases, bacterial diseases that are seed borne, so the bacterium is actually carried inside the seed, or using uh, tools uh, going from an infected area to a non infected area. Uh, if you have dirty tools, you can spread bacteria. So if you have a bacterium in your soil and you use a shovel or a hoe or something like that in that garden area and then move to an uninfected area, you're going to carry the bacterium over there. So it's always a good idea to clean your tools. Uh, phytoplasms are a special type of bacterium. Uh, they're usually just called a bacteria-like organism. They do not have a cell wall. So you can't grow these on artificial medium. Uh, they're hard to see, isolate under microscopes. Uh, they're limited to the phloem of the plant. And they are obligate parasites, as we mentioned with viruses. Bacteria in themselves are not obligate parasites, but phytoplasmas are obligate parasites. Without the plant host, there is no phytoplasma. It cannot live outside the plant host. So it's either living inside the plant or being transferred via vector from one plant to another. But it always has to be living inside of something. And uh, that's the obligate parasite, the phytoplasmas. Uh, here is how phytoplasmas are identified. They're usually, uh, extracts are taken, there's some uh, DNA work done. You look for distinctive bands that tell you that uh, you have a phytoplasma and which one it is. That's the only way you can really identify the phytoplasmas. And here are a couple of diseases caused by phytoplasmas. Uh, maize bushy stunt. And you can see the corn plants are much shorter, the leaves are streaked with yellow, uh, it's not going to be producing anything, and that is called by a phytoplasma, and one that uh, in our area is fairly new but is very devastating, and that's a lethal bronzing. Um, used to be Texas Phoenix palm decline, now it's called lethal bronzing, but you can see here is a date palm, and the outer fronds are dying, turn brown, the spear will eventually die, and this is caused by a phytoplasma, and it's a very rapidly acting. Uh, mature palm tree can get infected, and in one year, that phytoplasma will kill the palm. And these are also considered bacterial type diseases. Now the symptoms of bacterial diseases, you'll have all kinds of different symptoms as you can see listed here. You'll have leaf spots, leaf blights, cankers, wilts, uh, fruit, stem, and crown rots, and galls. Uh, now with bacteria, a lot of the uh, leaf spots that you see will be very angular and very linear because it's hard for the bacterium to move across leaf veins. So it can move in the tissue between veins, but it can't move across the leaf veins very easily. And so for that reason, they will form very angular uh, leaf spots and lesions. Um, with bacterial leaf spots, a lot of times you'll have a yellow halo that surrounds the lesion. Not always, uh, but that is uh, often the case. And with bacterial rots, uh, you'll often have a very, very slimy uh, tissue rot, and it'll also be very foul odor uh, if it's a bacterial rot. 
And uh, as we mentioned, with a lot of these diseases, it's often difficult to distinguish what is causing the disease uh, without some true investigative uh, resources, uh, such as the plant disease clinic, the plant disease lab. Uh, they can actually tell you what the causal organism is, but just looking at it, sometimes it's really difficult. Now here are some bacterial disease symptoms. Uh, we're going to point out real quickly here for you. Uh, here's bacterial spec. Uh, you see there's the dark necrotic lesions surrounded by a yellow halo. Uh, black rot is a bacterial disease in crucifers, uh, such as cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. And this one you can see the lesion is almost making a V shape. Uh, it infected here and as it follows the inner venal leaf tissue and not crossing veins very easily, it makes these V-shaped lesions on the leaves. Uh, that's black rot, which is another bacterial disease. Bacterial canker. This is a canker symptom inside the stem of a tomato plant. Uh, you can see all this dead tissue caused by the bacteria. Uh, we mentioned soft rots and how they're very slimy and very odorous. This is lettuce infected with a bacterium causing soft rot. And uh, with some of these, such as lettuce and cabbage, a lot of times you'll have the outer leaves that look fairly healthy, and then when you open it up, inside is where you have all the slimy, foul-smelling rot occurring, uh, because it's within those outer leaves where the humidity is high, the moisture is available, and the bacterium really has a good time. Uh, crown gall, caused by agrobacterium tumefaciens. This is crown gall on a rose. Uh, crown gall agrobacterium infects a lot of different plants, and it'll form these tumorous, warty-looking galls. Uh, the interesting thing about crown gall disease is the bacterium will infect the plant, and once it infects the cell, it has extra nucleic acid, the plasmids that I talked about earlier, and it actually transfers some of its DNA to the genome of its host. And so that's what causes the host to make all these galls. It's the bacterium actually gives the host some of its DNA. Uh, here's another soft rot disease. This is on peppers actually on the vine still on the plant. Uh, soft rot, bacterial disease, uh, bacterial leaf blight. This is a blight disease. You can see the leaves are dying. They're chlorotic. They're necrotic. Uh, the whole leaf is dying from this bacterial infection. Uh, citrus canker, a very, dev very devastating disease to the citrus industry. It's only on the surface, but it is very contagious. causes these warty lesions on both the leaves, the fruits, and the stem. That's a canker disease. A bacterial spot on pepper. And you see, this one's a little bit different from the bacterial speck that we have over here in that uh, the spot doesn't have those necrotic, uh, it has the necrotic lesions, but no chlorotic halo, at least at, at this stage of the disease. So that's bacterial spot. Uh, this is a potato tuber. I'm sure a lot of us at some point have cut open a potato and found something like this on the inside. That's a ring spot caused by a bacterium in potatoes, and it's actually infecting the cambium of the potato. Remember, the potato is an underground stem. So here is the cambial layer, and that's where the bacterium is mostly infecting because it's, uh, remember, it's living in the uh, phloem tissue on those. Uh, bacterial wilt, here's multiple symptoms of bacterial wilt. This is a stem that's infected. You can see the necrosis here, the discoloration. A healthy stem of uh, most plants, when you cut it open, will be nice and white or very light green on the inside. If you see this dark discoloration, that's a good indication that you have a disease, often bacterial, but fung fungal diseases will cause that same discoloration. And you see why it's called a wilt? The whole plant it's just wilting, even though there's plenty of water, and it's not too hot, but the bacterium is plugging up the xylem and the 
water transfer tissue. And so even though there's plenty of water, the plant's not getting any because the bacterium is living down here in the roots and in the lower stem area, plugging up all the pipes so the plant doesn't get any water, it's gonna wilt and die. Now this is a unique symptom that you'll see and often use to diagnose stem infections in, in bacteria as bacterial. Uh, this stem was cut apart and it has these sticky, slimy strings that form as you pull it apart. And these are bacterial strings of bacteria stuck together and making that slimy tissue. So you pull it apart and it makes these slimes. You can also cut it and stick the stem into a container of water, a clear container, and you can see the bacteria oozing out and making streams coming down into the water. So that's a diagnostic tool for bacterial wilt and bacterial diseases. Now to control bacterial diseases, once again, identify it, know what it is, know it's a bacterial disease, know what kind, and then you're ready to try to control it. Once again, start clean, certified bacteria-free seed and plants. So start clean, stay clean, sanitation, disinfect your tools, clean your equipment, clean your shoes, walking from field to field. Uh, crop rotation is another way to control bacterial diseases. That's where you're changing out crop families. Uh, as we'll get into later on in the course, the different uh, families of vegetables. Well, crop rotation, you would change out and grow one family of vegetables one year, the next year, or the next couple years, grow different families. And that's because a lot of these diseases are very specific to particular plants or plant families. And bacteria have a hard time living, most bacteria have a hard time living outside of the plant host, uh, these pathogenic bacteria. Um, so by rotating the crops, you're taking the, plant, the bacteria's food away from it and it starves to death over a couple of years, so you can come back in then uh, with the same crop a couple of years later and you won't have the disease problems. Uh, genetic resistance. There are resistant varieties to a lot of bacterial diseases. Uh, they've been bred for resistance. Once again, you can find that information in your seed catalog. Uh, Copper-containing pesticides. Copper is very deleterious to bacteria. Uh, it can help control bacterial diseases. Once a plant gets the diseases like viruses, uh, bacteria, even fungi, uh, you can't really cure a plant once it's got most of these diseases. So the way you want to control it is prevent it from getting the disease. Uh, using copper containing pesticides is a good way to control bacterial diseases. You can also do uh, antibiotics, uh, those aren't used very much in vegetable gardens, but there are some antibiotics that are used against bacterial diseases such as uh, tetracycline or streptomycin, uh, the phytoplasma disease we talked about earlier, the lethal bronzing, one way that palm trees are protected and treated to protect them from Lethal bronzing disease is doing injections of oxytetracycline on a regular basis. And this helps to prevent or to slow down disease development within the palm trees. And another way is grafting. Uh, why do I say grafting? Uh, well, you can, there is vegetable grafting, but if you have a particular variety that is susceptible to root bacteria infection, and you have another variety that is resistant, well, you take the roots from the one plant and the top from the other and graft them together, and then you have a resistant garden plant because the roots are resistant to the bacterial infection and the top still gives you the produce uh, that you want. So that's another way to control bacterial diseases. And now the main uh, be beastie, the main bad guy in all of our gardens 
fungi. So fungi, fungal-like organisms, they cause more plant disease than any other group of plant pathogens. Uh, here's a diagram, a simplified diagram of fungi. They exist, usually there's two different types. There's the septate and the non-septate. Uh, this is a hyphae drawn. Uh, with the septate hyphae, they actually have cell walls and delineate into individual cells with each one having a nucleus. And they're connected with an opening pore right here between the cells. Uh, Non-septate hyphae. The cytoplasm just flows back and forth amongst the entire hyphae. The cell wall is only on the outside of the hyphae. There's no cell wall dividing them into separate cells. And there's multiple nuclei within the hyphae just floating around. So that's two different types of hyphae that you'll see with fungi. Um, fungi can't make their own food because they don't have any chlorophyll. Um, they have a filamentous growth pattern. And so fungi are the ones that you can actually see with your naked eye. You see the, the filamentous growth or the hyphae. And so fungi you can see. And sometimes the reproductive structure of the fungi, mushrooms, those are fungi. That's the reproductive structure of the fun fungus. And those are very visible. And the majority of fungi do reproduce by spores. They produce spores. There are some that don't, but most of them do. And whenever the conditions get bad, such as in wintertime, they will overwinter in the soil or in plant debris. So as you can guess, well, as we'll point out later on, one of the ways to help reduce uh, fungal diseases is to clean up under your plants, to get rid of that plant debris. Don't leave it there over the winter for them to uh, hibernate and wait to attack your plants the next year. There are over 19,000 fungi that are known to cause plant diseases uh, worldwide. And um, what fungi can do is they will remain dormant on living tissue, plant tissue, or dead plant tissue and just lay there and wait for the conditions to get right for them to grow and infect, and then they'll take off again. And the fungi can spread through the soil, uh, through plant tissue by hyphal growth. That's how it spreads through the soil and through plant tissue as the hyphae grow, get longer, uh, invade different areas of the plant or the soil. They can spread that way. Uh, and in moist environment, environments, some fungi actually have swimming zoospores that swim from one area to the other. And they can move from one plant that's infected to one that's not and infect that way. They will infect through natural openings and wounds like bacteria do, uh, like viruses sometimes can. But, but fungi can also directly infect right through the cuticle of the plant. Uh, fungal spores that land on a plant, if they have um, most often it's around two hours. If they have two hours worth of surface water and the conditions are right, the fungal spore will germinate <clears throat> and actually directly penetrate the plant tissue. And once it's in there, it's in there. So now you have an infection. So it's another reason that we talk about the way you irrigate plants later on as a control mechanism. If you keep the leaves dry, then those fungal spores cannot infect your plant. <clears throat> and the spores of fungi, they are readily dispersed by wind, uh, water, through the soil, by insects carrying them, even by other animals, invertebrates carry them. Uh, even vertebrates, such as mammals, even people can spread uh, fungal spores from one plant to another. So <coughs> these spores are very are most often very resistant to dehydration and spread very easily. Now, some of the fungal disease symptoms, you're going to look at a lot of these and think, well, they look like bacterial disease symptoms to me, or they look like virus disease symptoms to me. Well, that's true, because a lot of the symptoms of all the different uh, diseases caused by the different organisms will be very similar. Once again, it's very important to identify what's causing the disease. Now, anthracnose, which you see here, is a particular type of uh, disease and symptom, and, 
And a lot of times you'll see these uh, circular necrotic lesions that often be concentric circles lined up. And uh, there's almost always a chlorotic halo surrounding uh, the lesion in anthracnose. Uh, leaf spot, here's a cercospora leaf spot. Uh, you can see it looks a lot like uh, frog eye in that you have a necrotic lesion with a light interior and then um, the necrotic lesion is circled by a chlorotic lesion. Um, this is cercospora leaf spot, septoria leaf spot, uh, frog eye leaf spot. You can see all of these, they have some similarities. Uh, leaf spotting diseases often are uh, fungal. As you can see now, these, as compared to the bacterial lesions, uh, they're circular, but you'll see them not angular or delineated by the veins so much as you do sometimes with bacterial uh, diseases. Rust. Rust is a fungal disease. Got his name because often rust is rust colored. This is bean rust. Uh, as the pustules mature and the spores are released, they actually have a kind of a reddish orange uh, dust that will come off of them. That's the fungal spores being spread. Uh, corn rust, as you can see, the orangey spores being released. So rust is another symptom of fungal diseases. Wilts, fusarium wilt, verticillium wilt. You can see those look pretty similar. Uh, what's happening is the roots are being infected by the fungus and it's killing the roots, uh, stopping the transfer of water up to the plant. The plant will eventually die because it can no longer get water. These are root diseases and this is the top showing the symptoms. Other fungal disease symptoms would be like uh, blights. Uh, blight is when just the plants are just look like they're scorched, uh, being wiped out. Uh, this is late blight on tomato. This is early blight on tomato. You can see uh, there is some differences. And why do they have different names? Well, sometimes the names tell you something about the disease. Early blight is usually earlier in the season uh, when the conditions are right for this particular fungus to infect. Later in the year, as the season gets further along, you'll get late blight because that's when the conditions are right for this particular fungus to infect. Um, but you can see they're both very devastating diseases. Uh, Phytophthora blight, this is a stem, you can see discoloration. This is a soil uh, pathogen infecting the roots, uh, the lower stem area. And you see they've got discoloration here within the stem. Uh, that's Phytophthora blight. Uh, scab, it's because it makes these warty, rough patches on the plant, on the leaves and on the fruit. Uh, this is citrus scab. Uh, the fruit is perfectly fine on the inside, um, but on the outside you'll have all these lesions caused by the fungus. Uh, potato scab is another one. Now, this is one you've probably seen. You can even find this sometimes when you're buying potatoes. It's just little rough, scabby, warty looking lesions on the outside surface of the potato. Uh, that's potato scab. Uh, you can have rots such as this one, sour rot on a tomato. Uh, you can see actually the white hyphae here from the fungus that's infecting that tomato and causing it to rot. And you can even get galls caused by fungi. Uh, this is black knot. This is on um, a tree rather than on a vegetable. But you can see the warty gall looking appearance. This is from a fungus. Remember there's also galls caused by bacterium and there's galls caused by viruses. So you can see that a lot of these organisms give similar symptoms on the plants. Some other fungal disease symptoms, uh, canker. Uh, we can see here Cytospora canker. This is on a peach and the stem 
has huge lesions on it caused by a fungus and you can have damping off that's where as the seedling starts to grow and develop the fungus infects right at the area right near the soil line and the little seedling will just drop over because the fungus completely destroys this part of the stem <clears throat> that's damping off disease there's several fungi that will cause that you can have uh, the stems themselves this is infected a little high up on the plant uh, probably caused by splashing the spores up onto the plant and you have stem rot where the the stems above ground are actually infected and beginning to rot and be destroyed. Uh, you can have root rots. This is Fusarium root rot on young plants. You can see the roots are totally destroyed, discolored. Healthy roots are white or light green. These have been destroyed by the fungus. You can see lesions on the stem. Once again, dark discoloration lesions on stems and roots is usually a sign of some type of uh, disease infection. You can get diebacks uh, where the tops of the plants are actually dying back. Uh, a lot of times root infections will cause dieback on plants where the roots are infected but the very tips of the leaves of the stems uh, and the young leaves will wither and die because those are the farthest away from the water source. So as it's killing the roots, the tissue farthest from the roots is the first to die, and this will be dieback. And then there are the mildews. Here's cucumber downy mildew, cucumber powdery mildew. Uh, these are devastating uh, diseases on a lot of cucurbits, and they will completely wipe out all the leaves on the plant, and when a plant has no leaves, it can no longer photosynthesize and so the plant will die. So these are two different uh, mildew diseases, downy mildew and powdery mildew. Now how do you control these fungal diseases? Once again, you need to identify, identify that it is a disease and not an abiotic disorder. Identify which disease it is and what fungus is causing that disease if it is a fungus. And once you know that, then you're ready uh, to do some control measures. However, before that, by starting with disease-free seeds and plants, start clean, stay clean. Uh, stay clean part is the sanitation. So between working uh, with different plants and especially going from different garden to another garden, always disinfest your tools and equipment. You can do that with 10% Clorox solution. You can do it with 70% alcohol. Different ways of uh, disinfesting your tools and your equipment. And so you want to do that because you don't want to spread the fungal diseases and pathogens from one area to another. Another part of staying clean is removing the plant debris. Any plant debris that falls off of your plant, go ahead and get rid of it, whether it looks diseased or not. Don't let it pile up around underneath your plants because it can become infected or it may have an infection already. And if you had gotten rid of it, then you're reducing the inoculum. But by leaving it there, the fungus will go continue to grow and produce spores that can be spread by the wind, by you, by splashing water. So once again, remove that uh, plant debris and be sure to remove and discard any diseased plants. And when I say discard, that means put them in a garbage bag or something like that and get rid of them. Do not put them in your compost pile. If you put them in your compost pile, especially uh, if the compost pile never heats up to proper temperatures, all you're going to do is, when you use that compost, introduce those disease-causing organisms into your garden. Don't put diseased plants into your compost pile. Uh, resistant varieties. That's another way. Starting clean, staying clean. You can stay clean by using resistant varieties. Uh, once again, checking your catalogs, you'll find there are a lot of vegetable varieties that have been bred and developed with resistance to different fungal pathogens. So use those resistant varieties. Uh, they're good. Right. Remember how we talked about well, water on leaf surfaces? being required for a fungal spore to germinate and infect directly 
into the leaf tissue. Now, water on the leaf surfaces can also even spread back, uh, bacteria and fungal spores into those natural openings. So the bacterium or the fungal spores are carried along by the water on the leaf surface and they go into the natural openings. So water again can help to cause that infection. So when you irrigate, irrigate the roots, not the leaves. The plant takes up water through its roots, water in the soil. So the water that the plant needs is going to be in the soil. So if you make sure that when you're irrigating, either with automatic irrigation systems or with hand watering, water the roots of the plant. Don't water the leaves. Uh, if you do use overhead irrigation and water, um, the upper portions of your plant, make sure that you're irrigating during uh, the early morning hours so that the plant has time to dry rapidly as the sun comes up. Never water late in the evening or else the leaf tissue and the plant will stay moist all night long. That gives the fungi, the bacteria, plenty of time to do their infection. So where you irrigate and when you irrigate is very important for controlling diseases, especially fungal diseases. Once again, crop rotation is a good way to control fungal diseases. If they're soil-borne, sometimes you can rotate out for a year or two and the fungus uh, dies or is greatly reduced in the soil so that you can come back in and grow what you had there before without worries about disease. Soil solarization, uh, We'll have an article about that in the extra material, but that's a good way of uh, sterilizing, not really, but eliminating a lot of pathogens in your soil by doing soil solarization. You can eliminate bacteria, fungi, uh, and sometimes nematodes by doing soil solarization. So make sure you check that article out. Good drainage. Make sure your gardens have very good drainage. Excess water will stress the plant. It can kill the roots, making them susceptible to fungal infection. Fungi need water. So if the soil drains well, the fungus doesn't survive quite as well in the soil. And so provide good drainage for your plants. And when all else fails, you can resort to fungicides. Um, there are a lot of fungicides out there. Once again, make sure you know what you're trying to control before you purchase or use a fungicide. Remember from the fungicide safety class earlier, we talked about knowing exactly what you're trying to control and whether what you're buying is going to control it before you purchase. Because if you use a fungicide that kills Phytophthora and you have verticillium, uh, perhaps you're not going to get any control at all, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your time, and you're putting stuff in the soil that doesn't need to be there. So fungicides are good, but you got to know what you're controlling. And it's not on the list, but mulching your plants is another good way of controlling a lot of these diseases. Now, as you're going to find out later in a class coming up, uh, mulching is a good way to control weeds, but you can also reduce some of your diseases on your plants by using uh, good mulch. Um, with the good layer of mulch, when it rains, the amount of splattering is reduced, so you're not going to spread fungal spores and bacteria splattering from the soil because the soil is covered by mulch. So mulching is also a good way to control diseases. So with that, we're going to end this class. I hope we haven't scared you out of gardening now by showing you all these problems you can have <laughs> from viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Um, it's a natural occurring thing, and there are ways that you can control it. And what we wanted to do is to show you uh, this so you learn to recognize when you actually have a problem and different ways you can control it. Uh, now, we didn't go over the higher pathogenic um, plants, which you can have, or We've already covered nematodes earlier, uh, so happy gardening, and there is a way to win that war. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute.
this, Chris. I gotta add something to the video. I forgot to tell everybody. One of the biggest things about identifying plant disease is know what a healthy plant looks like. So make sure if you're growing something, you get pictures of a healthy plant or you see some growing somewhere and you know what it's supposed to look like when it's healthy and then you'll know what it looks like when it's unhealthy. Whew, I'm glad we're gonna get that in the video. Thanks, Chris. That Joe's crazy. <laughs>